and we've been in a series called Just Do It. Somebody say, Just Do It. And basically, I've prayed about, and the team has prayed about, what are some things we think are so expedient that you really don't need to think about them. You just need to do them, you know. It, these are things that are right for you to do, amen, without giving much thought to it. And so we've dealt with everything. I've been on the subject of prayer for the last three weeks, uh, talking about just pray. You can get parts one, two, and three. You can go to our YouTube. How many of you are, are subscribers to our YouTube channel? If you're not, please become subscribers. We need all of you who love us, all of you who watch us on Facebook, the better platform that you can watch us on and really get go back retroactively and, and pick up our messages is on YouTube. So please be a subscriber for us. Even while I'm preaching, you can go and subscribe. I want to see our subscription grow. We want to reach more people for the Lord, and we want that platform to become a far-reaching platform for us. So we've been talking about that. You can catch those messages there. Today, I want to talk to you about just follow him, just follow him. And what I'm talking about is following Jesus. I want you to know that the decision to follow Jesus is one that you really don't have to spend too much time praying about, thinking about. I believe that the day when you have an opportunity to hear and understand how much you are loved by God and what the plan is for God, amen, that you should simply say, I want to follow him. I look in the, the Gospel of Luke, which is not where I'm preaching from, but I, I think about when Jesus called his disciples. One of them, name was Levi. We've come to know him as Matthew, but his name is Levi. And Levi was a tax collector, and he's sitting in his office doing his work. And Jesus walks up to him and says, you, come follow me. And the Bible says, straight away, he, he drops what he's doing, and he follows Jesus. He quits his job, gives up his profession as a tax collector, which was a very lucrative uh, profession back in his time, and he just decides to follow Jesus. Now, this is the kind of response I would hope that any one of us, when we hear the gospel of Jesus, the good news about his love for us, I believe that's the reaction every one of us should have. But I also know that there are people who have objections, People who have objections, when we look around in our world today, we see, I mean, religion has become a foul, foul cesspool. It's really not something that people want to swim in. Amen. They feel as if, uh, and, and I, I must agree with some of the things I've seen lately, I, 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 I really pray strongly that real Christians would distinguish themselves through Christ-like behavior and integrity because everybody's a Christian now. I heard a bishop cursing. <laughs> I, heard, I heard some of the most ridiculous things, people calling themselves Christians, and worst off, calling themselves bishops. And I am appalled at some of the things. I, I don't blame people for being turned off with religion. It's, 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 it's horrific what we're seeing. But those of you who know him, I beg you, follow him. Walk with him. Work on becoming more and more like him every day of your life. Because Christianity is not about showing up in church and lifting your hands and singing songs. That's all good and well. Christianity is to imitate him. It's to try to be like him. If you're not doing that, it's missing from your life. And I pray that today something will flip on on the inside of you and you'll become so obsessed to pursue Jesus and to be like him. And that's the only way that the real church will distinguish itself from phony Christians and phony bishops and phony pastors. And you will not be fooled if you follow him. Look with me in Mark 10, verses 17 through 22. I'm going to read something for you, and I'll tell you a little story and pull some truth out from that. And my objective is to simply help you deal with some of the objections I think you may have to following Jesus. Mark 10, 17 says, And as he was setting out on his journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not murder. Do not commit adultery. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your mother and father. And he said to him, Teacher, all these things I have done from my youth. 
And Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said to him, you lack one thing. Go sell all that you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come follow me. Disheartened by the saying, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. Father, just as I, as I teach your word, let the revelation of who you are, let the re revelation of your love unfold in this place. It is my prayer in Jesus' name. So, a couple of things when I read this text, and there's more to it. I'm going to get you all the way down to verse 30 and pull out some truth because I think that's all I want to do today is just to, uh, to pull out some truth from there that I think is, is critical for our understanding if we are going to, if you don't know Jesus and you've had objections, amen, I want God to reveal, I pray this morning, God to reveal himself in such a way that you will leave here saying, I, I want to follow him. I want to walk with him. Because there's a lot of stuff out there about God, about Jesus, a lot of what I call native superstitions about God that are just not true. And you may have even heard some of these things that I'm going to talk about in this text today preached and maybe heard it wrong. I'm going to tell it to you right today. Amen? So the first thing I realize in this text is this, and I want to share this with you today. And God wants you to know more than anything else, and it is this. Salvation is not gained by works of the law. Salvation is not something that you can earn. Salvation is not something that you earn by your own virtue. I talk to a lot of people, and they will defend to the death that they are good people. And I don't fight people when they tell me that they're good people. I, who am I to question how good you are? Only God knows how good you are. And yet in this text, Jesus said to the young man who approaches him, not as the son of God, but just as a rabbi that he admired. And, he's, and he says, I know you are good. And Jesus said, well, there's nobody good but God. So let's start there. So our standard for what good is is different from God's standard. And so, 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 so by all means, be, be virtuous and be good as a person. But you don't do that to think that that is sufficient to get you into heaven. The young man told Jesus, said, Jesus, all of the things that you outlined for me, which are the things of the law, he says, I've done those things since a child. I've, I've been a good person. I've been a virtuous person. And please, again, I'm not knocking virtue. We ought to be good people. We ought to be kind and loving. We ought to care for the weak. We ought to love our neighbors as ourselves. These are things Jesus taught us, but these are not ways to inherit the kingdom of God. These are things we do that reflects that the kingdom of God has come to us. Amen? And we live these things out so as to give glory to him, to our king. See the difference? But this guy said, Jesus, I've done those things. But that is not a requirement for heaven. Okay? Your sweat equity won't get you into heaven. Because salvation is not gained by works of the law. Obedience to God's commands is important, but simply following religious rules without, and regulations without relationship is a form of bondage in of itself. It, 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 it keeps your focus on the external things while ignoring the issues of the heart. And if you listen to Jesus' teaching, amen, he would say time and time again, he talks about becoming defiled. He talks about guarding your heart because, you know, God is concerned more about your motive than your methodology. And God looks within our heart. He looks within our heart when we're worshiping. He looks within our heart when we're giving. He looks in your heart in every thing that you do because all that matters to God is your motive, the inner parts of you. So Jesus realized that there was something missing in this young man's life. He realized that though you are virtuous and a good person, there's something that you're missing. And that's true for all of us here this morning if we don't have what Jesus is about to give this young man. And what Jesus wanted to give this young man, I believe, is a key to everything in life, both in this life and the next. And if you have this thing that Jesus told him that he liked and Jesus was about to give him, anything is possible. Without this thing, it is impossible to please God. Some of you already know what I'm talking about. It's called faith. It's called faith. When you don't have faith, the only thing you have to lean on is your own wisdom. 
The writer of Proverbs said this in Proverbs 3 and verse 5. He says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean to your own understanding, but in all your ways acknowledge him and he will establish your, your path. When you don't have faith, you have to trust you. When you don't have faith in God, you don't have a fundamental belief that God's got this, you have to put everything on yourself. Problem with that is self will fail you at some point. It will fail you. And this is what Jesus was trying to help this young man with. He was trying to give him the gift of faith. The second thing is this. When you believe that you were loved by God, his words and his commandments will never offend you. When you believe that you are loved by God, none of his words or his commandments will ever seem difficult for you. It's true that there are things in the Bible that challenge us at a very, very deep level. It's true that, let me be frank, there are some things in the Bible that I just don't like. I wish it weren't there. And I wish I could, 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 could get it out of there, but I would always know that there is something that I, you know, I'm missing. The fact is, however, because I fundamentally know that I'm loved by Jesus, even the hard things that he might say to me are easier to bear just because I know he means me well. Does that make sense? Now, here's what the Bible says. He said, Jesus, looking at him, loved him. What did that look, look like? I mean, what, how did Mark, and Matthew also records it, but he doesn't say that part. But was a, what? What, what, what would that have looked like when, when for, for, for Mark to say, uh, boy, I remember that day when Jesus met up with that young man and he's, oh yeah, and he looked at him a certain way and man, that was, he loved him. What would that have looked like? I don't know. I ponder that. And maybe if I get an answer, I'll tell you later on if the Holy Ghost reveals it to me. But the thing though is not so much that, but it was, what is significant is that Jesus loves you. He loves you more than you know. And if, and, if, and if he could stand here with me and look at you this morning, I guarantee you he'd have that same look of love in his eyes for you. He is googly-eyed over you. He cares deeply about you. And he wants nothing but the best for you. Do you understand what I'm telling you this morning? And that's important for you to understand because if you don't believe that, then the commandments of God seem grievous. Y'all know that ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, and ain't no river wide enough. When you love somebody, nothing seems hard. We sing those things, right? Because it's, we're saying, hey, we, I love you so much, it doesn't matter what it takes, I'm going to get to you, babe. Well, it's the same thing with God. Ain't no mountain high enough, ain't no valley low enough, no river wide enough to keep me from pleasing you, God. But you've got to know that the difference is not religion, it's not rules, it's not regulations, but it is a relationship. And the foundation of that relationship is he loves you. I love him because he first loved me. How many believe that you're loved this morning? Ten people believe that? This whole room, ten people? Okay. He loves you. And he wants the best for you. The third thing is this, and I'm going quickly. Divesting yourself of material wealth is not a requirement for entering the kingdom of God. And I need to deal with this because people struggle with this. This is a big hurdle for a lot of people who already are blessed materially. I call it being afflicted with affluenza. If you have been afflicted with affluenza... This is a struggle for you because who is ready to give away everything they have just so they can start going to church? And who are you going to give it to? See, and so, so that verse, there are people who are actually so jaded <laughs> that they think that preachers put this verse in there for their own benefit. Isn't that weird? I've heard people say that. But let me, let me, let me help you with this. This is, Jesus did not tell the young man to do that so that he can inherit heaven. He already told him, obey God's commands and you'll be all right. 
The reason why Jesus added this is because he said, I've done those things since I was a child. In other words, give me more. My level is higher than other people's. Throw me something a little harder. As if keeping the law wasn't hard enough. There are 613 laws between the civil laws, the ceremonial laws, and the moral law. There are 613 laws in Jewish law. No one can keep all the law. No one. I can't even keep the Ten Commandments all together. How many of you need some help with the Ten? <laughs> this young man said, Jesus, I, I got that in the pocket already. Give me something that I don't know. Throw me, a, throw me your best fastball. And so Jesus said in Matthew, recalls him saying, well, then, if you would be perfect, then go sell all that you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Make a note of that, and you will have treasure in heaven. And then he says, come follow me. So please don't get this idea and don't get scared that you've got to give everything you have away so you can follow Jesus. That is not what he is saying. That is not what he's saying. That is not a requirement to follow Jesus. But in selling all he had, Jesus was inviting the young man to a fresh start, a new walk of faith defined by dependency upon God, absent of the confidence that he had in his worldly possessions. But he was too blinded by his disease called affluenza. He couldn't do it. The Bible said he went away very, very distraught, very sad, very angry. Because he just could not obey that which he asked Jesus. He provoked Jesus to add to the commandments. So I hope you got that. Thank God. Somebody say, thank God. I don't have to give it all away to follow Jesus. Let me also say another truth here relative to this text. Because after Jesus deals, deals with this young man and he walks away distraught, Jesus stands in and watches him walk away. And he looks at his disciples and he says, Fellas, it's really hard for the rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. It's really hard. In fact, it's easier, he says, for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for the rich to enter. I mean, that's virtually impossible now. If, 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 you're, if you're being you know, literal about this. I know it's an analogy that's it's, it's hyperbole, meaning to make a point of how difficult something is. And that's, that's a very good one. Jesus is kind of funny, too. I mean, think about that picture. A camel? You know, I'm at an age right now where even with my glasses, I can't thread a needle. I can't even push a little piece of thread. Back in the day when I was, I get mad at people who can do it without glasses. They just get, give me that. I'm like, <laughs> I, get, I got glasses on. Denise, and I can't even... And think about a camel. So I think it's a funny picture, but it's hyperbole, and it's just meant to say it's really, really hard. It's really, really hard. But not impossible, because they said, the disciples said to him, then who can be saved, Jesus? And he says, with man it is impossible, but with God all things are possible. So here's the next truth I want to tell you is this. God has no problem with the rich. It is the rich who have a problem with God. Somebody's clapping. I think that was good to clap right there. Thank you, Pastor Sherry. She's so supportive of her husband. She's always trying to help me preach. No one's going to join her, but that's okay. <laughs> Can I tell you something? Affluenza, as I humorously refer to riches, affluenza can cause you to have one of several symptoms. It can cause you to become selfish. Most human beings, all human beings are, are, are selfish. Some of us more than others, but we're all selfish. It's just human nature. Let's admit that now. My wife is very generous, but don't mess with her mangoes. Don't mess with her mangoes. Just you ask. Anything else you can take, don't touch her mangoes. But let me just be frank with you in, in, in seriousness. All human beings are selfish. It's, that's the fundamental part of our nature to be selfish. Do you see that? Can you admit that? 
You might be kind, but you're still selfish. If you, if you really measure it against the objective standard of Jesus, we're all selfish. And affluenza can just bring that out and intensify that in you even more than when you didn't have it. Another thing it can do, it can lead to arrogance and elitism. It can. You know, I, I, won't, I won't have to elaborate on that. You know what that, that means. All right? It can also deceive people into believing that they can even earn their way into heaven through philanthropy. I, I think it's good to do good. Jesus is clear about that. But you can't earn heaven. I once had a friend. He's, he's with the Lord now because I led him to the Lord. But he was afflicted with this disease. And... Uh, <laughs> um, you know, and he was Jewish, and he, he used to walk around, and he showed me this, with a blank check in his wallet. And one day we got into a conversation about God, and he says, well, you see this here? I said, what is that? He said, this is a blank check, and he was very deadly serious about this. I said, what is that for? He says, well, if I kick the bucket tomorrow when I stand before him, if all the things I've done is not enough. This blank check, he can write out cash, anything. from, And he was serious. He was serious. And I tried to picture God going through his pockets. <laughs> when, when he crossed over into the pearly gate on the other side, I tried to say, come here, let me frisk you. And <laughs> let me, what is, oh, okay, you're good. How much do you have in your account? Okay, I'm taking all of it. <laughs> I tried to picture what that would look like. It's, it's utterly ridiculous. But, and what was more ridiculous is he really believed that. But over time, the Lord allowed us to have conversations and to talk more and more about the Lord until I was able to finally lead him to the Lord one September evening. And he said, oh, this is so beautiful. This is so awesome. He said, I didn't know it was that easy. I said, it's that easy. He said, I really do believe in him. I just never understood him. And he came to faith before he passed away. And I'm looking forward to being with him again. But I'll never forget this idea that he carried around that if all the things that he has done or never done was not enough, that that check would take care of everything. I don't know if there are many people who do that, but may I say to you that there are people who believe that the good works they do and the gifts that they give back to the poor or to community or whatever cause they support or whatever save the whales or whatever, they somehow feel like God says, oh, that's, that's good, you're good. You can come up here and be with me. You didn't believe in Jesus? Oh, that doesn't matter. That's just, come on. We'll talk about that later. Really? And see, affluenza can deceive you into thinking that your philanthropy and your good works will get you to heaven. It doesn't work. There's also a thing called the never enough virus. You ever heard of that? Never enough for me, for me, all that money you can give me. <laughs> Do you know that there are people, once you begin to make money, there's this deception that comes with money that says, oh, I made my first million, now I want to make my second. Rather than becoming more generous, you begin to withhold because your goal is to reach the next plateau of rich. And as you start associating with wealthy people, you realize you're not quite where they are, so now that's not enough. You need to start what stacking it so you can move up to the next level. And, and, and it is proven that the, the, the richer you become is the less you give proportionally to what you earn. Let's say 10% is the tithe, is the measure of the base measure of your, your generosity. People who used to tithe, when they become super successful and wealthy, they stop tithing because they start thinking that the 10%, that's just too much to give away when they have more than enough to live on. And God brought them to where they are because they were faithful. But the richer you get, the less you give. Jesus talks about this never enough virus in Luke 12 when he said that there was a guy that had a great year and his, he had so much crops he couldn't hold it all in his barn. And he made a decision, an executive decision, and that decision was, ah, I'll just build a bigger barn. That's the never enough syndrome telling you that even though you have more than enough for yourself, there's nobody else in the world that matters. And even the more than enough, it's all yours and none of it will be shared with anyone. And Jesus said, you fool, when you die, you're taking none of that with you. Now, please hear me well. It's not God that has a problem with the rich. He loves all of us the same, rich or poor. 
It is the rich who have a problem with God. You see, because money is a God of its own, that if you don't rule over it, it will soon rule over you. And see, it's either he's your master or your money's your master. And God sees that as direct competition for your heart. That's why Jesus talks about it so much. And he's always warning us to be careful. He's always pushing us towards generosity. He's always telling us, think about others and don't just think about yourself. I hope you all are hearing me today. So it's not God that has a problem with the rich. It's the rich who has a problem with God. Because God challenges all of us who have been blessed to be generous and to give what we have. Jesus said it's hard but not impossible for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. And Paul's instruction to those in the church who were rich was, Paul says this, he says, As for the rich in this present age, charge them to not be haughty. Mean, don't be stuck up nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. Don't set your hopes in your riches. Set your hopes in God who provides everything that you have. And then he goes on to say they are to do good. Be rich in good works. Support missions. Help us out. Let's go to Lebanon and do some work. Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. And then he goes on to say to be generous and ready to share the storing up, here's that line again, treasures for themselves as a good foundation for the future so that they may take hold of what is truly life. Does it sound like God wants us to avoid the affluenza that comes with being affluent? He sure does. Now here's the last thing I want to tell you, and it is this. Your level of sacrifice depends on God's call in your life. Your level of obedience determines your level of reward. Your level of sacrifice determines the level of call or what God's call is on your life. And then your level of obedience determines the reward that you receive. What do I mean by that? Peter then said to Jesus in the rest of that text, he says, See, Lord, we left everything and followed you. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sisters or mother or father or children or lands for my sake and for the gospel who will not receive a hundredfold in this life. Houses and brothers and sisters and mothers and children and lands with persecution. And in the age to come, they will also receive eternal life. I want you to know that and don't miss that. So Peter and the 12 apostles, first of all, I, mean, I need to make the distinction. They're called to be foundational apostles. Nevertheless, what Jesus tells them is true for us. Jesus, uh, Peter and the 12 apostles have a special place in, in, the, in the plan of God. And what they received was beyond anything they could have imagined. However, my question to you this morning is what is God calling you to do? What is he calling you to that your comfortable life might have blinded you to? Some young people, I believe, need to go on missions trips. I, I think it's a healthy thing to go on missions at least once a year. Clap your hands. Come, somebody believe that. If you've never, even if you're an adult and you've never been on a mission trip and you're not from a country outside of America, I think you need to go and see how real people live. I think you need to go and serve the poor. I think you, know, you need to go and get an understanding of what life is like for other people in other parts of the world. It'll change you. It'll, it'll give you a different set of values, and you'll understand more the things that Jesus is teaching. But what is he calling you to that your comfy life is keeping you from? That's an important thing for you today. I pray you to hear the voice of God because God calls us. He doesn't call all of us to give up everything. I can tell you my story. You know, when I first came to Jesus, all he asked me to give up was my sins. That's all. I left him at the altar. And some of them tried to follow me. <laughs> so, for, so for some years, I was fighting and wrestling with some of them things, you know. But for the most part, I understood that he wanted me to. So I left my sins there, and I started to trust him. He didn't ask me to give up everything to follow him. But as the years went by and I got more mature in the Lord, and, and it became clear to me that God was calling me to lead his people, I had to make another level of sacrifice. And my wife can tell you what an adventure that was. Because here we were with five children, you know having just purchased our first home, me getting used to being a homeowner, had a great job, great benefits, you know, taking care of my family. I told my wife, you quit your job. You know, you stay home with the kids. I got this, babe. 
And, and we, were, we, were, we were working together. And, we, you know, she was covering the home front. Meanwhile, I was, I was you know, working hard and bringing home the bacon. Yeah, bought our first new car. You know, no more used cars. I, things are good. I got a home. I got a new car. Things are looking good. And then, and then God makes it clear that he was calling me to lead his people. And so I said, okay, no problem. I didn't really want to be a pastor because I liked the life I had. I didn't mind going to your church and paying you tithes as a pastor. I'm cool. You know, I, I didn't want to be the pastor, you know. But God kept making that clear to me. So I finally said, okay, God, yes, I'll follow you. And I knew the minute I said yes to God, it was going to come. And it did. Everywhere I turned, everybody, every, every meeting we went to, people were telling me, the Lord is calling you to go full time. I'm like, no, I'm going to be bivocational for now. Thank you very much. I have a lot of bills to pay. I have some children at home. I can't keep food in my fridge because when you have five kids, I don't know if you know that your refrigerator is like Grand Central Station. <laughs> the more you have is the less you have in your refrigerator. And I, we just had to keep that thing full. And it, it was just it's an impossibility. But, but there we were. We're trying to manage our five children, right? My first home, paying mortgage and all of those things. And then in 1998, finally the Lord got a hold of me. And I knew that pastoring and working full-time was not cutting it for us. Our church was struggling. It was very anemic at the time, and I knew I wasn't giving God my all because how do you work 72 hours a week and still preach, teach Sunday school, lead worship, and drive the church bus? Yours truly was doing that. I was doing that and working six days a week. How many of you know that I did that? Yeah, you better be impressed. <laughs> it's not as easy as I make it sound. You better be impressed. <laughs> And guess what? So we did that. And then God says, quit your job. Now here is when I had a struggle with God. Because that meant I was going to have to trust God and trust the generosity and the obedience of people to keep me and my family and that refrigerator full. That was not an easy thing for me. But now it got more intense because I had to make a decision. And I'll just tell it, shorten it. I, I quit my job. I gave up everything. I gave up even the, the opportunity to, to, to at least get to where I was vested so I could have a pension. I left three months shy of that. My boss told me, says, why don't you take a one-year leave of absence so if things don't work out, you can come back. And I just didn't like the way that sounded. It sounded good on one end, but I, 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 I felt convicted even thinking about it. Because I said, if things don't work out, <laughs> they better work out. <laughs> I'm, <laughs> I'm not coming back here to beg you for my job. He says, Mott, you've been here. You're a good work. I said, I know, but I really feel like God wants me. He said, but you don't have to quit. I said, I feel like I need to cut ties. And, folks, I made that decision to walk away from pretty much all the things that was the security for my future. I could have retired six years ago from my job. And I said to the Lord, I said, if I, if, if I stay here and work for the next 20 years to get to 55, what will your call on my life look like? if I stay in this mode of compromise, doing vi bivocational ministry. And I said, you know what, it's a gamble, but I'd rather trust you, cut ties, and dive in all the way. And I got this crazy wife. Come on. Yeah. I've got this wife that has radical, crazy faith, so she wasn't much help. So I was hoping she'd take the conservative route and say, we've got these kids, and you've got to pay the mortgage, and I'm not working. She didn't do any of that. She said, honey... Whatever you decide, I'm with you. Y'all better clap for Pastor Sherry. She said, I'm with you. And as I was, I was studying this, the Holy Spirit nudged me and said, hey, you did that. You let go of security. You can preach this message with conviction. You have walked this, and you are living this. And I hope that these words I'm breathing over you today are sticking to you because I don't know what God is calling some of you to that your comfortable life is keeping you from. But I'm here to challenge you this morning with the truth of God. Because Jesus makes a promise, and I'm closing with that. He says, there's none of you that will ever leave any of those things behind for me. Come on, somebody. That will not in this life reap a hundredfold of what you sowed into me. Y'all will miss that. Y'all miss that, but you need to read that for yourself. He says, in this life, and you will have eternal life in the next. So how many of you know I'm living for the reward and the hundredfold return of God upon my life? Can I ask you to be happy for me when it comes? 
Can I ask you not to get jealous? Can I ask you not to go talking about me when I'm, when I'm living in it? Come on, somebody. Tell him, I went to his church. I heard his story. That man deserves it. Come on and give God some praise. But you also need to know that what is true of me is true for you. What God has promised me, he has promised you. Would you stand up? He's a faithful God. I love Jesus. I hope, I, ho I hope somehow you caught something today. I hope some of the objections that you've had have been dealt with, have been removed from your life because, you know, Jesus wants you to just follow him. Some of you have been thinking about this for too long. And I don't know what else you need to know, what else you need to hear. I think the only thing you need to hear right now is that you are so loved by him and that there's nothing that you've ever done that he will not forgive you of. Yes. I don't care if you've dabbled in witchcraft. I don't care what you've done. I don't care if you've walked on the dark side and dined with the devil. Jesus loves you. If you're here this morning, he's got a plan for your life. As long as you're willing to do like I did, is to leave your sins at the altar today, Jesus will receive you, and you can leave here a change. You can leave here a new person with a new hope. Another powerful word from uh, our preachers here at Generations Church. I love a good well preached word was that a good word online church it was a good word right i know i'm not the only one that thinks that if you today you you listen to the word and you you something moved in your heart and you just felt god calling you or you responded to this sermon i want you to just type i have decided meaning today you made a decision to follow christ you made a commitment or renewed an old commitment to following christ we celebrate you here at generations church we're excited for you and we want to help you on your journey so type i have decided so one of our hosts can reach out to you pray with you and look one thing that i love is that our prayer team is eager to get these names if you if you uh made a decision to follow christ our prayer team will pray for you we hand those names over to them and they are praying for you isn't that awesome you got people who you don't even know and they don't know you, but they love you and they are praying for you and covering you. That's awesome. And look, don't feel excluded. Everybody who has a prayer request can do the same thing, not just if you made a commitment today, but if you just have a general prayer, prayer request, our prayer team would love, love, love the opportunity to lift you up, lift up your family in prayer and hold you guys down. So that's always available. Make use of that. Uh, they're waiting. All right. So that's it for me. I'll see you guys next week. Love you. Stay blessed. And I challenge you to bless somebody. Intentionally bless somebody.